Hi again. In The Rise of Adventism by Edwin Scott Gaustad, General Editor, this is Jonathan Butler's contribution in Chapter 10, Adventism and the American Experience, Part 2. Millerite apocalypticism took the classical premillennial form of a political withdrawal. Millerites expatriated themselves from the evangelical benevolent empire, for they could share neither its optimism for the gradual amelioration, that is improvement of societal evils, nor its faith in the durability of political institutions. They foretold an imminent cataclysm that would dash the hopes of a Jacksonian millennium. Millerites clearly had been part of the Yankee Empire and gave up their citizenship only gradually, and maybe reluctantly. Revisionist history has dispelled the notion of them as an oddball fringe in sharp discontinuity with their period. At one point, perhaps, as many as 50,000 of these Adventists scattered over New England and western New York as an integral part of the millennial ethos of the late 1830s and early 1840s, anticipating, with the majority of Anglo-American Protestants, that something would happen eschatologically around 1843, and seeing themselves, rightly, as an extension of, or at least an epilogue to, the Second Great Awakening. Whitney Cross writes, quote, The Millerites cannot be dismissed as ignorant farmers or libertarian frontiersmen, impoverished victims of economic change, or hypnotized followers of a maniac thrown into prominence merely by freak coincidence when the whole of American Protestantism came so very close to the same beliefs. Their doctrine was the logical absolute of fundamentalist orthodoxy, as perfectionism was the extreme of revivalism, end of quote. Timothy, Timothy Smith concurs that Miller gained adherence by advocating a sensational variant of the views they, that is other Protestants, all preached. Millerites, at the outset anyway, sought to form a voluntary association within the evangelical united front that coalesced an interdenominational membership without compromising the varied faiths in order to pursue the single utilitarian purpose of preaching the Second Advent. The Millerite leaders typically had held membership in several humanitarian associations when they first heard or read the prophetic lectures of Miller. Joseph Bates had helped organize a local temperance society as early as 1827 and an anti-slavery society in the mid-1830s. Henry Jones, too, was both a temperance and an anti-slavery man. Charles Fitch wrote the pamphlet Slaveholding Weighed in the Balance of Truth and Its Comparative Guilt in 1837, about the time he was introduced to Millerism. George Storrs, in the early 1840s, was a frequent companion of Orange Scott, the founder of the Wesleyan Methodist Church. Joshua V. Himes, the promoter who lifted Miller to fame, had built the Chardon Street Chapel of Boston and had sponsored a number of reform causes. As Millerites, they usually forfeited membership in their reform associations. They came to realize how fundamentally the Millerite Association precluded the wide-ranging wide -ranging humanitarianism of other evangelicals. To be sure, they retained the Yankee values so that their premillennialism involved a message of judgment upon intemperance and slavery, Sabbath abuse, and capital punishment. But Joseph Bates's reminiscence some years later proved representative. Here's a direct quote from Joseph Bates. Some of my good friends that were engaged in the temperance and abolition cause came to know why I could not attend their stated meetings as formally, and argued that my belief in the coming of the Savior should make me more ardent in endeavoring to suppress these growing evils. My reply was that in embracing the doctrine of the second coming of the Savior, I found enough to engage my whole time in getting ready for such an event, and aiding others to do the same, and that all who embrace this doctrine would, and must necessarily, be advocates of temperance and the abolition of slavery, and those who oppose the doctrine of the second advent in Millerism would not be very effective laborers in moral reform. And further, I could not see my duty in leaving such a great work to labor single-handed as we had done when so much more could be accomplished in working at the fountainhead and make us every way right as we should be for the coming of the Lord. 
End of quote. While preaching Millerism in the South, Bates was asked by a judge if he were an abolitionist who had come to free slaves. Yes, judge, he replied. I am an abolitionist and have come to get your slaves and you too. As to getting your slaves from you, we have no such intention. We teach that Christ is coming and we want you all saved. End of quote. The spring 1844 date passed uneventfully to the dismay of Bates and other Millerites. But the seventh month faction urged a new date, October 22, 1844. And a reluctant Miller finally agreed by early October to such a precise time setting. Miller explained, quote, if Christ does not come within 20 or 25 days, I shall feel twice the disappointment I did in the spring, end of quote. As the midnight hour approached, the potatoes rotted in Millerite fields and corn stood unharvested. The sense of apocalyptic time left derelict any long-range earthly concerns. The Millerites by this time had suffered ridicule, abuse, and banishment from evangelical churches. Public and press in popular caricatures had built the scaffolding and fashioned the ascension robes that would haunt post-Millerite Adventism for decades and would influence historiography as well. Probably both Millerites and their detractors should shoulder a portion of the blame for this. The Jacksonian era periodically erupted in mob violence, brawls, and lynchings, a potentially unfriendly atmosphere for the likes of Millerites, and the evangelical effort to reinstate some form of Protestant establishment in America could betray an intolerance in the case of the Adventists. On the other hand, Millerites themselves had been the aggressors in declaring the spiritual bankruptcy of mainline evangelicalism. The Adventist Voluntary, Voluntary Association, as one among numerous evangelical enterprises, had turned sectarian and exclusivist. Millerite cynicism for either ecclesiastical or political institutions could be expected. George Storrs expressed the come-outer attitude when he compared evangelical churches to the apocalyptic harlot Babylon. Quote, Take care, he told believers, that you do not seek to manufacture another church. No church can be organized by man's invention, but what it becomes Babylon the moment it is organized. End of quote. Storrs further identified post-millennialism, formalism, and materialism as elements of a false church, and added that evangelical chaplains in the military were another sign of nominal Christianity. For the government, as well as the churches, was a beast of the book of Revelation, and voting or holding office was a mark of the beast. These Adventists were then apolitical apocalyptics, in that they spurned even minimal political participation as they awaited an imminent end. Political institutions, for them, were demonic, serving no positive role. The degenerative nature of government, including that of the United States, was among the signs of the end. Put in a link to how C.T. Russell mirrored the attitude of stores towards the world and, the, and government in particular. An organization, this idea that any time a church gets organized, it is Babylon. Russell was certainly no organization man. We'll put in Ray Franz's discussion of that. Not only does Ray Franz make the point that Russell was not an organization man, nor was the Apostle Peter, who famously said, To whom shall we go? You have sayings of everlasting life. So I'll put in a playlist as well as that reference, that uh, video link to Ray Franz's discussion of this. And the playlist, Have Jehovah's Witnesses Ever Been God's Organization?